Good morning, everyone, and happy Valentine's Day. Uh, I'm Cameron Carey. I'm the uh, Ann and Andrew Tisch Distinguishing Visiting Fellow here at the Brookings Institution, and I'm glad to welcome you uh, here this morning. Uh, today is it's not just Valentine's Day, it's an anniversary. Um, it was four years ago that uh, NIST uh, released uh, the uh, the NIST cybersecurity framework, uh, and uh, we actually had uh, uh, an event here at Brookings. Uh, uh, Pat Gallagher, the then undersecretary at NIST, uh, came and gave sort of the first uh, public discussion of NIST, and uh, I had the opportunity to have my first uh, appearance as a uh, visiting fellow here at Brookings to talk about the the framework, uh, and, you know, having uh, uh, been sort of part of the hatching of it at the Department of Commerce, uh, have been pleased to see uh, uh, its release, to see the uh, the uptake of the NIST framework in the intervening time. Um, uh, Gartner estimated uh, a couple of years ago that about 30 percent of companies uh, in the U.S. are now uh, now using the framework. Um, the uh, president's executive order uh, last May um, reaffirmed the framework and directs uh, federal agencies uh, uh, to, uh, to use it. Uh, and of course, we're now uh, in the final stages of NIST uh, doing what I guess is version 1.1.2 uh, of, uh, of the framework, which will be out uh, sometime soon. Um, and uh, just today is uh, launching some new features of the website to, to make, uh, make the framework uh, more accessible. So that sort of sets the scene for our program today, to look at uh, where we have come uh, in terms of preparedness uh, and resiliency in those four years, uh, um, and what still needs to be done. So we have, I think, a, a terrific group of panelists uh, today, of people who have been uh, deeply engaged uh, uh, in this issue, um, certainly over the past four years, but, uh, but beyond. So uh, we will kick off uh, our program this morning with uh, some, uh, some remarks uh, from Assistant uh, Secretary uh, uh, in the Office of uh, Cybersecurity and Communications uh, at DHS, uh, part of the National uh, uh, Programs and Protection uh, Directorate, um, the cybersecurity operational arm of, of DHS. Um, uh, and uh, after that, uh, I will introduce the other panelists, and we'll have a, uh, a Q&A. Uh, so uh, please remember to silence your cell phones. Um, uh, don't necessarily turn them off, because we encourage you to tweet uh, with the hashtag uh, up there. Um, and uh, invite, uh, invite your questions uh, uh, after we have some of the panel discussion. So. Um, let me uh, introduce uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Manfra, who has been in public service uh, since uh, she went into the Army as a communications and an intelligence uh, officer, uh, and has been in a variety of cybersecurity jobs uh, at, uh, at DHS, uh, at the National Security Council, uh, and particularly focused on critical infrastructure. Uh, she was appointed uh, as the Assistant Secretary um, last June, so please join me in welcoming Assistant Secretary Manfra. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Cam, for that kind introduction. And thank you, all of you, for being here. Uh, 
I was, as I came here, I was thinking it was a little over 10 years ago that as a grad student across the street, I used to come here and uh, listen to various different events. And uh, it's, a, it's pretty amazing to be standing here um, actually presenting at one of these events with such distinguished colleagues that we'll talk with later on the, on the panel. And um, I think one of the things that, uh, and I, I love about these events, we're sort of taking a look back at, at how far we've come. Um, my own career almost sort of tracks how cybersecurity has changed so much. And so for me personally, it's, um, it's often very uh, interesting and, and I think rewarding to, to think about how much has changed over the years. When I joined the Army in the late 90s, we sort of had the early days of thinking about net-centric warfare, if that's a term that folks <laughs> still think about. And, you know, I was, I was learning how to, you know, put patch radios together and, and figure out how we can uh, connect to these newfangled fax machines to use in the field. And, um, and then, you know, sort of spending the, the time that I did in the Army and, and seeing how that changed um, through the, um, the wars and, and how we thought differently about communications and networks and, and what it means to both defend and, and take advantage of those capabilities from the military. And uh, when I got out, um, decided to go to grad school and kind of continue those national security studies. And... Um, uh, somebody came up to me and was like, there's, uh, there's this new office that's starting at the Department of Homeland Security called the Office of Cybersecurity and Communications, and we're helping them stand it up, and, and uh, we think that you have kind of a right background. And um, I'd spent most of the time overseas, so I was like, what is this new department? I'm not exactly tracking all of this. And, um, but I was able to, I decided to just sort of take a leap, and I was like, cybersecurity, that sounds like something I could, you know, get into. And, um, and so I started um, with the department actually standing up the office that I now have the honor of running. And I will tell you, if you ever have the opportunity in your life to be the ground floor um, building an office and, and then be able to work through all of the different ways and thinking about, I had the opportunity to serve with um, Secretary Johnson on the National Security Council in a variety of areas and seeing this issue from so many different perspectives. Um, we used to joke that, um, you know, when we first sort of started, nobody would pay attention. We're trying to tell people about the importance of cybersecurity and defending our networks and, and most people would just sort of say, oh, I got some IT ladies and men working on that. I'm not really sure, it's a, it's a little bit confusing. What does that actually mean to my business or what does that mean to my agency? And, and look where we are now. Um, you know, I had the privilege of working with, uh, with NIST on the cybersecurity framework, and we're now at this point where throughout the country and frankly throughout the world, people are recognizing that cyber is not some niche technical thing that they can just trust and hope that um, somebody in a closet somewhere is working on and addressing, but it is actually something that needs to be considered as part of their enterprise risk management approach, whether you're an agency, in the federal government, a state and local entity, or in the private sector. And in that it really challenges much of what we think about uh, what the role of government is, what the role of the private sector is in managing that risk. And so what I want to talk to you very briefly about, because I want to make sure we have enough time for the panel, is sort of where we are in the administration and where DHS is at in thinking about how we manage that risk and the role of DHS and the role of companies in, in managing that risk. So as I assume all of you know, uh, President Trump did issue an executive order in May of last year on strengthening the cybersecurity of federal networks and critical infrastructure. As was noted, um, a key part of that was requiring federal agencies to adopt an implement the cybersecurity framework and reinforcing that agency heads are accountable for the cybersecurity of their systems and their networks. And we believe that that's a very important message. Just like an uh, industry CEO is ultimately responsible for the risk uh, to include the cybersecurity risk to their systems, we are equally accountable within the government for the risk to our systems and networks. But 
There is risk to an individual organization that they can manage and they have insight on, but there's also what we call you know, sort of that broader enterprise or sometimes even systemic risk. And that's where DHS often uh, comes into play, particularly with the, uh, starting with the federal cybersecurity, what the executive order really tried to look at is transitioning from thinking about agencies managing individual risk individually to thinking of the government as an enterprise, that we have enterprise risk as a government that we need to improve our visibility on and improve our ability to manage. And so DHS plays in that that place. We provide tools and capabilities and we're increasingly providing more. We're looking at shared services, looking at how we can uh, have more cost effective and efficient ways of deploying those capabilities and services. But what that also allows is DHS to have visibility on that, what is that enterprise risk to the federal government and what can we do to better manage our vulnerabilities. That an agency may have one perspective, but there may be some gaps and seams across the organization, again, thinking about the government holistically that way. And so as many of you hopefully read the IT modernization report, looking at how we transition both more modernizing our IT, uh, the systems themselves, but also modernizing how we think about governing and procuring <laughs> IT, how we think about managing security, modernizing how we manage security on the government side. And we're looking at really how, what are the best practices in industry and how can we apply those to the government. This is a monumental effort for the government to undertake. It's one that um, has, you know, We've had various different efforts previously, and we have made progress. Um, but this, I believe, really highlights that this, the, the need for this to be a priority, the priority for resourcing, modernizing our, our systems, but also, again, modernizing and thinking differently about how we do security. So that's a key part in much of what DHS is focused on. But again, always going back to that cybersecurity framework as our touch point of this is how you need to think about cyber risk. And when we, when we think about industry, what we have been um, focusing on, and it actually started in that same executive order that um, required the, um, the cybersecurity framework, was also tasking DHS to think about um, and analyze where are where do we have the potential where a cyber incident could have catastrophic consequences? And doing that analysis to refine our understanding of what, is, what are those critical services and functions that whether they reside in industry or in government, federal, state, local, what are those critical services and functions and who performs those? And how do we ensure that those entities have the information, the resources, the capabilities they need to defend against what is again, both an individual company or agency risk, but also a national risk. And what that is, and we're continuing to refine that, we're continuing to work with industry, but I believe that this is, um, it, on the critical infrastructure side, probably our most important um, work that we'll be doing and we'll continue to do that we've been building on for the past few years. We can all say, okay, we want to have trust and, and, and ensure the um, integrity of the financial system. We want to ensure that we have access to clean water, that the electricity system continues to, uh, to, continues to run, and that there may be actors out there who are interested and disrupting those capabilities. So how do we, as government and industry, refine our understanding of what those services and functions are, who provides them, who are those stakeholders that need to be a part of that conversation, and how does the government, again, ensure that we have that sufficient understanding to where we're able to use all of the capabilities that the government has available to it to one, be looking out for those who are trying to disrupt those and, and provide appropriate alerts and warnings, but also be able to collaborate with industry to prevent somebody or um, somebody or some uh, group of somebody's from doing that. Um, but if we can't prevent it, which we have to recognize that you're, we're not going to be able to prevent every sort of cyber incident that happens. We all, for those of you who work in this space, there's a lot going on and, and it's hard to detect and prevent everything. But if we understand the business of, of industry and we understand the, the mission of those agencies and what it is that they need to continue to operate uh, and who those service providers are and who those entities are that are part of that overall delivery of those services and functions. And then we start building those contingency plans to ensure that should we have some indication that something um, anomalous is happening and, and again for those of you who work in um, you know sort of particularly in cyber incident response usually you have no idea what's going 
going on in the first um, few uh, moments and often probably a little bit longer than that. But collaborating together when, you know, we've, I've talked before about, about WannaCry and the notion of collective defense, that the government doesn't know everything, industry doesn't know everything, our international partners don't know everything. But together, if we come together and we're sharing, this is right down to, this is a piece of malware, I think this is what it's doing, what do you think? Here's a product I wanna push out from DHS. We just issued a, um, a product around what we call Hidden Cobra, which is the North Koreans uh, malware, the latest one was malware, but we've also issued products around infrastructure that they're using. So we're working together as a government saying, here's information that we have, we're putting it out, <laughs> We do work with industry even before putting out some of these products so that they can, you know, check it, make sure that this is what they're seeing. We're complementing each other's resources, authorities, and capabilities, and then we're all working together to take action. That is easy to say, very, very hard to implement. But what DHS does have is the authorities and the, um, the infrastructure to be able to do this. And what I will say is we have an enormously um, committed and dedicated private sector and state and local governments who are willing to do what it takes to work with us and the other elements of the government to solve these challenges. But for us, it really has to come down to how do we really understand that systemic or potentially catastrophic risk and what are those pieces that we're putting in place to ensure that collectively we're best prepared to defend against those. And so that's what we're working on going forward. And again, I'm so honored to be here and I look forward to continuing with the panel discussion. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Jeanette Manfra. Uh, and, you know, it struck me uh, as you were talking about your communications background and putting to, together <coughs> radios, uh, uh, and I didn't plan it this way, but uh, we have here a group of panelists who uh, really understand in a very deep way the technologies that, that we're dealing with. So um, Annie Anton uh, is... Uh, I guess maybe the uh, the Grace Hopper of our time. She is a computer scientist, uh, a professor, and former head of the Department of Interactive uh, Computing uh, at Georgia Tech. Uh, she also served uh, on uh, a range of advisory boards, both public, uh, uh, private, and nonprofit. Um, uh, for an issues of defense, uh, of uh, cybersecurity, of uh, privacy. Um, and in particular, was a member of the National Commission on uh, Cybersecurity uh, Resiliency uh, that uh, about 18 months ago uh, took a look at uh, the issues of cybersecurity, made a series of recommendations for the next administration. Uh, Tom Wheeler, uh, to uh, her left, um, is, I guess, a, a Washington institution, but uh, a, uh, an entrepreneur at, at heart. Uh, so, so Tom uh, headed uh, both the National Cable Television Association and then the uh, uh, Cellular Telecommunications and Internet Association. When both of those were upstart uh, industries, um, uh, and in between, he's been a, a serial entrepreneur, venture capitalist, uh, uh, and an author of uh, history books. Uh, and of course, uh, um, was chairman of uh, the FCC and sort of brought, I think, to the chairmanship uh, about the depth of his experience in communications and that same sort of uh, entrepreneurial spirit. So delighted to have both of you uh, uh, here today. Let me uh, just first uh, sort of invite you uh, to, if you have any comments in response to, uh, to Jeanette Manfro's <laughs> remarks. Um, and, and Annie, maybe if you could look at a little bit of, sort of where um, 
where we are 18 months down the road in terms of the recommendations mm -hmm. uh, of the National Commission. Sure. So um, at a very high level, when, when I was on the Cybersecurity Commission, we came up with six different imperatives um, that were basic high-level recommendations for the federal government in terms of how we can enhance national cybersecurity. And um, at a very high level, I think I'm very pleased to say, and thanks to Kevin Stein over at NIST, who is our staffer, key staffer on the uh, Cybersecurity mm -hmm. Commission, uh, Kevin and I had a nice chat yesterday looking at those imperatives and seeing what's been done on each of them. And so at a very high level, something has been done on all of the imperatives, mm -hmm. and there's been some action, some of which is currently um, in place. So there was a report that went to the White House, I believe, a, a week ago that's not public yet uh, about uh, IT workforce. Uh, once that becomes public, then there will have been some action on every, on every imperative of the six that were uh, presented by the commission. And so, you know, we're not there yet, but there has been action and activity. Um, you know, there's a lot of vulnerabilities and a lot of concerns nationally, but I think that uh, it's very gratifying to see that we are making progress and we are taking it seriously. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I think we, if we're going to celebrate the fourth anniversary, we need to also begin by identifying who one of the leading culprits in <laughs> the establishment of the framework was, the guy in the blue suit uh, at the end of the line here, and, and recognizing your role uh, in that camp, uh, for which we should all be grateful. Um, you know, as I listened to the Assistant Secretary talk, um, you know, my thought was, Thank God for DHS. Thank God you're there, and that this kind of overriding structure is being put in place across the government and working with the with the private sector. Um, my experience coming out of both industry uh, and and the FCC um, is that cyber is not something, it's everything. And that my concern as I see policy progressing, particularly um, looking at it from, from my former agency's point of view, is that the agency chartered by Congress with the principal responsibility for overseeing the security of our commercial networks is a wall. To use an, an army term, as an old <laughs> army person here, um, and um, and that they have been walking away from um, from uh, responsibilities um, that many times can only take place in a regulatory structure. Um, and uh, so hopefully, um, as a whole of government approach to cyber, um, we can uh, begin to see some changes insofar as the oversight of the commercial networks themselves. Jeanette, any, uh, any thoughts on that? And particularly, I think uh, <coughs> that there's Maybe are there conflicting messages in the legal authorities? Who's in charge of uh, critical infrastructure? Hmm. Who's in charge? Um, I would say the department by um, policy that, uh, frankly, has endured through multiple administrations is responsible for orchestrating the overall mm -hmm. strategic um, framework for critical infrastructure. Um, in addition to sort of some of the specific sectors of many of the sectors that we have responsibility for. But the Secretary of Homeland Security is really responsible for that overarching um, approach to critical infrastructure, everything from, from cyber to natural hazards to counterterrorism, sort of the, that entire suite of issues that we have to work with on, on critical infrastructure. I don't love the term in charge because... You know, it's you know, it mm -hmm. just it sort of implies yeah. that we're directing others, and it's all a partnership. Um, but but yeah, I would say the department has that sort of overarching responsibility 
um, to ensure that the the entire kind of critical infrastructure community and uh, and that the government are focused on the you know priorities that we have those mutual understanding um, and that we are connecting the um, national risk that cuts across sectors for example those sorts of things um, are, are our responsibility mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and by the way, Tom, let me uh, uh, thank you for, for your sort of kind compliments. But I think the, uh, the real, I mean, I have you know, some championship, I guess, with the NIST framework. But the real, uh, the real work was done in the agency. Um, and I will tell you that one of the best decisions that we made in the Commerce Department in the Obama administration was to make Pat Gallagher uh, the, uh, the director of NIST and eventually uh, the undersecretary. Um, and he, of course, was part of the, mm-hmm. the National Commission as well, uh, has been just a tremendous uh, leader. He was a career uh, scientist uh, uh, at NIST. Um, uh, and I think uh, I see in... Uh, Jeanette Manfra as well. Um, so what Tom said, the uh, uh, you know the virtues of having professionalism and experience, uh, um, and we need that in cybersecurity. And, and fortunately, we 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 have that, uh, and I think that's uh, um, a reason. I think you know, we see uh, a surprising amount of, of continuity. Um, let me uh, ask uh, ask you a, a question on that because I had I had a conversation with uh, uh, a uh, a policymaker in the executive branch uh, on the continuity that, that we see sometime sometime last year after the executive order, um, and he said yes that's true, uh, but we need to do more to make people do things. And particularly, I think talking maybe about the critical infrastructure. Is there is there more that's that's in the works? Uh, you know, is there is there going to be in some form, or, or, or is the government going to make people uh, do things? Um, I would say that what we're we're looking at is um, are all the incentives sort of aligned in the right way. Um, And what I see is a a lot of willingness and a lot of benefit on the voluntary work that we're doing and that a lot of it has to do with DHS sort of stepping up to do more, more collaboration, um, more leaning into the authorities that we've we've already got to um, ensure that industry understands um, the, um, the, the pers- perspective that we have and can make their risk management decisions based off of information that we have. Um, you know, we have um, used sort of the authorities that we have to direct federal agencies to um, indicate um, publicly risk tolerances that we have. And, uh, and, and we've seen that that has an impact on the market as well. Um, so I would I would say that's that's sort of a that's a good framing is you know fundamentally all the pieces the policy framework it, it's there what we're looking at are are those are those incentives aligned in all of the right areas to ensure that we have again those those critical services and functions the right organizations taking the steps we need to to take so. I know that's a somewhat of a, of a mm-hmm. broad answer, but it's it is because we're looking across the the, the landscape, and and thinking uh, differently about how we how we sort of incentivize action. I would say. So I know you were talking mm-hmm. specifically about regulations. Um, personal opinion, I think that there is a tremendous amount of work that can be done uh, in a voluntary uh, partnership, and that I believe that DHS just we haven't sort of brought the full capacity to bear that we mm-hmm. that we have, and and so that's where I believe that I'm very much focused on. Uh, we just I want to ensure there's 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 a use for regulations and there's a use for other incentives that a government has, and I just want to make sure that we're very smart in how we apply each of those levers that the government has available to us. Um, but, you know, that's sort of my, I guess I, my personal I think, I think you're spot on. The, the, the points are, uh, it, it, you know, in particular in 
in a field that is evolving so rapidly in which you do something and the, the bad guys have all kinds of incentive to move fast to undo that. Mm -hmm. um, the regulation becomes very difficult. Mm -hmm. What we tried to put in place was what I called agile regulation, mm -hmm. like agile software development mm -hmm. that is always trying to respond. But there are two components to that. One is that you have to say, and, and you're going to do this. We're going to do this together, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because there are consequences for not. And secondly is there needs to be leadership in helping to get to those voluntary solutions. So, for instance, mm -hmm. the standards for the new fifth-generation wireless network. When we left office, we had proposed a notice of inquiry that said that there need to be included in the 5G standards um, cyber as a forethought. Mm -hmm. Rather than what we always do is, oh, my God, afterwards we go running and mm -hmm. how do you do, do patches? And so we teed up a notice of inquiry that asked a whole series of questions for industry, for academics, for folks to say, these are the kind of things that ought to be included in the 5G standard, which is still in process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Trump FCC killed that inquiry. And, um, you know, it, so it didn't come as a great surprise to me when all of a sudden you see the NSC floating the idea of we're worried about what the security of a 5G network is going to be, and we've got to look at, at what I consider to be draconian solutions. But there is this balance that we have to work out, and no place is it more important than in cyber. Mm -hmm. but, but a key to that balance is, excuse me, there is a watchman, a watch person mm -hmm. on duty here. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think there's all other ways also of uh, trying to address this. So I understand, I, I'm embarrassed I can't remember the name of the bill, but there's a bill that's being worked on now about IoT device security. Hmm. And the idea there is that the federal government would um, only procure from companies with devices that meet a specific level of, of standard security. <laughs> so that's one way in which I see the current administration um, trying to do things differently is just to really improve the federal IT procurement process, for instance, by mm -hmm. which we were talking about earlier, by, um, by setting up standards. I, it's just a, another approach. I, I, yeah. I, 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 Totally agree. Yeah, there's there's absolutely rule for regulators. I mean, FCC is, as you all know, independent body, so in, they um, would go through their decision making progress process. I um, I think that um, we believe there's a very um, critical role for regulators, and we've partnered with FCC with a variety of different regulators and sort of their role in how they assist in managing that risk. And um, but that's a, but exactly as you said. That's, there's always this sort of delicate balance of of how you um, how you best incentivize, um, and and so that to that point, you know, the areas that we can sort of have more authority over is looking at uh, how does. You know, DHS is, um, for those who don't know, we're um, appropriated uh, a, a decent bit of money to um, pro go through a process where we procure um, tools and capabilities or largely around continuous monitoring um, for other agencies. And um, what that model allows us to do is not only have a consistent set of tools are, that are deployed, but it also leverages the purchasing power of the entire government so we get better <laughs> rates. Um, it lowers the cost. Um, but it also, we now, you know, we have a set now of, uh, related to this program, approved products lists. So products that go through um, review that we, you know, we can say, these, these are the products that um, are approved to work at, uh, as a part of this, um, this program, the Continuous Diagnostics Mitigation Program. Um, and then importantly, um, 
though less relevant to this particular discussion, but it actually provides us with operational insights because the um, benefit of to us of us buying those tools is then we require that the agencies send that data back to us. And, and so that is what allows us now to have that, that picture. Um, and this, so there's a lot of different things like that. Procurement is a huge one um, that, can, that can have, it won't change the entire market. I don't I, you know, pretend to think that the government has that much market space. But, um, but it, can, um, it, it can incentivize, it can provide some um, indications of, of what the government is looking for. Um, but I completely agree that the, the regulators need to be a part of this conversation and that they have a, a very critical role. Um, but I don't pretend to sort of speak on behalf of those independent regulators. Yeah. So. Yeah. Tom, how, how broad are the FCC's uh, authorities on device licensing? And to what extent could the FCC, uh, by, by rules or otherwise, uh, uh, deal with some of the issues of, uh, of IoT devices uh, through those authorities? So after the Dyne attacks in, mm -hmm. what, 16, right? Um, I got a letter from Senator Warner asking a whole series of questions about specifically on that point. Mm -hmm. Because the FCC licenses, I'm, so, I'm sorry, doesn't license. The FCC has to type accept every emitting device in the country, whether it's your cell phone or your coffee maker that connects to the Internet. Okay. Yeah. And um, and that's for very logical reasons. It's for RF interference. And let's make sure the airwaves aren't going to get all screwed mm -hmm. up with spurious emissions. I responded to Senator Warner and said, if we think that protecting the airwaves from interference is important enough that there should be type acceptance of products, why shouldn't one of those inspections that have to be made be a cyber assurance for mm -hmm. that product? Because as we all know, in the Dyne situation, I mean, there is a market failure here. I mean, when you're when you're making the chip that goes to the board, that goes in the camera, that goes to Best Buy, that goes to the consumer, nobody in that supply chain is asking any question about cybersecurity. Mostly, they're saying, "Talk to me about price." So, if as a part of this kind of assurance on products to make sure they don't interfere with the airwaves, why shouldn't it be asking the question, has something been done to mitigate concerns or anticipate concerns about cyber threats? Yeah. Either you see changes <coughs> in that sort of supply chain ecology? Mm. Is that well, are events forcing that? Um, so I don't, I, you know, I'm not privy to, to insights on the supply chain. However, I will say that it was a major focus of the commission. Um, mm -hmm. It's something of great concern. And one thing you didn't mention also is just on the, it, at the end of the user, the consumer, who doesn't know whether or not a device or a system that they've purchased is secure and wouldn't know how to. And so that was one of the major thrusts also, is how do we mm -hmm. make sure that we're educating not just the workforce, but consumers at large um, on how do you secure devices and how do you make sure that you can trust a, a system. Um, so you probably have a lot more insight into the supply chain than I do. Um, yeah, so supply chain is something that we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're really spending a fair amount of time. We have stood up a... Um, an internal supply chain initiative um, around how do we how do we sort of tackle um, what becomes a really quickly really complicated <laughs> with that much we've learned um, and you sort of you have hardware you've got software and then you've got this sort of IoT piece and it's um, it but I do believe that you know we can't sort of all just throw up our hands 
and say, well, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's too complicated. Um, I'll never know where the code's coming from. At, at some point, you know, we will know. We can figure it out. We're, well, we, the collective we, not just the government. Um, and, and so what we've been working on is to, how do we kind of scope the problem? How do we ensure, you know, really focusing um, on... Um, particularly on government. How do we assist in working with, with GSA on ensuring that the right due diligence is, is done um, for contractors or for the products that, that folks are, are doing that has that sort of cyber risk in addition to other risks that the government's more used to kind of thinking about? So building the, the cyber risk um, into those um, assessments. And particularly for, on the government side, what we've been calling high-value assets, so sort of those various um, uh, systems that would have a high impact to the government if somebody did something with her. So we're standing that up and scoping um, what are those, how do we advise on supply chain risk, um, both to government entities, how, do, how does um, the, the government sort of procurement system which <laughs> we don't need to definitely go into any details about the government procurement system, but um, it, it is not designed to think about supply chain risk from a cyber perspective. It's thinking about other types of risks that the government is trying to manage, like financial risk and all those sorts of things. So we're working with the procurement community, with the counterintelligence community, with um, uh, you know folks like GSA, with NIST, a, a variety of folks to think about um, the government needs to kind of internally do better to understand its own supply chain chain risk just from its own providers. And we've also had a lot of really great conversations with um, manufacturers, um, software vendors, a, a lot of different folks, uh, the mobile community, and, and working really with that, more with the engineers to understand um, this is what we think the risk looks like. Is this what you think the risk looks like? And, and try to get that sense of, okay, if we can have an understanding of the risk of whether it's you know, companies or products that we're concerned about, um, and we kind of get to that mutual understanding, then try to have a conversation. Are there ways to technically mitigate that risk that everybody can be sort of satisfied with? Um, and, um, and then kind of on the IoT, that the, when we talk when the Cyber Commission is, you know, when you have your microwave or, you know, you, you've, you've got your little um, UL symbol that says that it, it passed a, a certain um, level of um, testing that says that this product does what it's supposed to do. Um, so is there some mechanism to do that for IoT? Um, because, yeah, it is, it is a cost, um, and, and we're not under any illusion that we're going to somehow convince every consumer um, to really think hard about cybersecurity before they buy that one particular product. So, how to, again, how do you get those right pieces in the market thinking about programs like Underwriter Laboratory that do that for existing consumer devices? Um, so those are sort of the different strains of, mm -hmm. of work that we're doing. So as, yeah. as perhaps one of the only or handful of engineers in the room, I actually have a question for you, oh boy. which is that when you were looking at, the, when engineers look at the vulnerabilities and when the government looks at the government vulnerabilities, are those aligned or are you seeing that there's some misalignment or gaps and that maybe that's where we should be focusing? I think, well, so sometimes there's differences of opinion on the technical side just because government has a certain amount of visibility of how um, something is actually engineered or something is actually architected on the industry side. So it's very useful for our technical folks and industry technical teams to get together to say, well, we're basing our risk judgments because we think this is how these are deployed. And if they're not done that way, then that's very useful for us in thinking about risk. Um, the other, a lot of what we come to is, you know, our risk decisions aren't always um, because of a technical scenario. It's because we're thinking about the broader sort of the geopolitical, the enterprise, all these other pieces. And so we've been having, I think, a lot of very useful conversations where you can say, let's help you understand where the government comes from when we're thinking about supply chain risk. And, um, and, and most companies, we sort of, we're all on the same page, generally, I would say. It's more about how we think about managing it. Um, and, um, and a lot of companies will come and say, we believe we've mitigated this through technical means. Let us walk, us, walk you through. And oftentimes, it's, we're, okay, yeah, we, we agree. That's a, that's a good way to mitigate that. And, um, and we're comfortable, but let's kind of keep talking as maybe the risk profile changes. Other times, you know, there's sort of broader kind of industry issues. There's not many other players. There's not many other, you know, sort of companies that are manufacturing this de these devices. So it's much more 
long-term issues that we have to think about in terms of how do we um, ensure that we have the right R&D in, uh, in places uh, that we would like to see um, more development of, of different types of capabilities, I guess, and, and systems and products. Um, so that's kind of a long answer, but I would, I would say that's sort of how it generally falls out. Yeah, you know, there's an interesting uh, change, I, I think, that I see in, in this area. I, rem I remember in uh, deputies committee meeting quoting a, a maxim uh, that, that from a NIST document, but it comes from uh, President Kennedy's National Security Advisor, McGeorge Bundy, that, that uh, if we protect our diamonds and our toothbrushes equally, um, we will save a lot of toothbrushes, but we will lose more diamonds. Um, and certainly that's, I think, been the, the operative approach in terms of focusing on, on critical infrastructure. Um, but that was before the Internet of Things. That was before toothbrushes were connected. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's exactly where I was going, oh, sorry. Was, sorry. Yeah, we've got a lot of connected toothbrushes out there, uh, quite, quite, quite literally. So uh, you know, maybe there is more we need to do to protect, uh, protect the toothbrushes. Um, so let's uh, let's talk about election systems because uh, that's uh, that's been designated as uh, as critical infrastructure, um, and the states seem to have uh, uh, come to an understanding that that doesn't mean they're being federalized, uh, um, and so. Uh, Jeanette, your your uh, testimony to the Intelligence Committee uh, last year uh, mm -hmm. uh, said that I guess it's what some 21 states uh, uh, were targeted, um, and you know some some number were compromised. I guess that that's a fact at, at this point. You, what do you mean by compromised? Do you, do you have one? What is? Um, yeah, sure. I think what do you the, get um, to from from uh, targeted to compromise? Right. So um, some of the unfortunately, <laughs> this is a bit nuanced, which is not always conveyed. Was um, first of all, let me just say, scanning by bad actors happens on the internet all the time. Mm -hmm. All the time. <laughs> and so that's one important point for, for those who aren't in this space for people to understand. Um, what we saw was in partnership with um, an organization called the Multi-State Information Sharing Analysis Center, which provides, um, so I talked about sensing capabilities that we provide for the government. Um, we actually um, provide some grant funding to them, and they provide um, some sensing capabilities for state and local organizations. And what we saw was... Um, the, the Russian actors that we were concerned with um, targeting and in, 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 mm -hmm. scanning um, uh, state and, and local systems. Um, so that was, um, that's that sort of that n nature of the, of the 21 states. Now, the important thing to understand is, um, again, as, as I think we all know now, um, these uh, systems are run by state and locals. The government doesn't have perfect visibility into um, these state and local systems. Um, we had what we had at, at the time, and we notified the um, targets of those, um, of those scans at the time. Um, when we talked about, I mean, you know, and I talked about the, te the testimony that there was a small number that were accessed, um, again, as you know, some of you know, you can get into a system that doesn't mean that you're successful in your ultimate mission, um, whatever that may be. Um, so it still stands that just, again, systems may have been accessed, but there's no, there is no evidence, old or new, that... Uh, any votes were actually manipulated. Those systems were not related to vote tallying systems. So, um, so I think it's important for um, the public to understand some of those those distinctions, um, and that's what I was talking about. And um, what I what I think um, is also very very important for the public to understand is how much. Um, progress has been made um, since um, former Secretary Johnson designated um, that sector as critical infrastructure. We have um, 
We have now what we call a government coordinating council, which is just government sort of speak for um, a, a forum that exists sort of under the um, DHS protections for having non-public conversations. Um, representatives uh, from state and local election official community we meet with on a regular basis. We're working through how do we ensure that when the government, just like the other sectors that I talk about, no different here, it's just a new sector that we haven't engaged with previously, how do we make sure that the, um, if the government has information that it's getting to the right people at the right time? Um, so working with all of the states to have those right points of contact to ensure that, again, if we have anything, um, that it gets to, to, to the right people and that they also have the plans within the states to, to manage that. Um, similarly, if they see something, how do they get that information to us? And then how does DHS ensure that it's getting to the right organizations within um, within the government and that we're collaborating to work on that. We've been able to issue um, clearances to those individuals so that, um, again, we always try to declassify everything that we can, but in some cases um, that's challenging, but we still need the information to get there. So these um, the state and, and local officials we're working through, and we've been able to issue some clearances. We're continuing to work. We've also worked with industry. Um, uh, we're, we've stood up, um, again, we call it a sector coordinating council. This is, again, this is just the term that we use for industry coming together under critical infrastructure. So this is voting machine uh, manufacturers, um, those that work on um, voter registration roles, those that think about um, uh, sort of uh, even you know, kind of analytics, election night reporting, those sorts of things, because we're trying to take a very holistic view um, uh, in thinking about election infrastructure and and how do we protect those so um, uh, there's I, I know the, the the work that we have done and, the, and importantly the work that the state and local officials are doing uh, doesn't get as much um, uh, play um, but there has mm -hmm. been just tremendous I, I would I've worked with a lot of sectors and a lot of really great sectors I've never seen a sector come together so quickly um, to be able to organize and organize itself around um, such a challenging issue and being able to have very productive conversations and um, and like you said there's there's no oversight there's no um, sort of federalization or nationalization of systems that's not remotely um, our, our intent at all um, but what that's what all these things have allowed us to do is work through again how do we build that system where those defenders those people that are responsible for managing those systems have access to everything that they need whether it's services that my organization has to conduct assessments or it's information that the government has to, to protect their networks so mm -hmm. So, Annie, Tom, thoughts on, on protecting our election systems? No, there or? were hearings uh, yesterday from right. uh, on elections, and our intelligence leaders are telling us to expect attacks on the midterm elections, and we need mm -hmm. to get ready for it. And uh, it's part of our critical infrastructure, and we, if we look at risk, I would say that the risk of undermining our democracy is very high. Uh, that's, a high that's something we want mm -hmm. to avoid. So. I can't add anything other than to go back where I started and say thank God for DHS. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I think fair, fair to say that you know, the attackers uh, have learned a lot. So people, you know, they, they may not have manipulated systems, but they've had a lot of opportunity to map systems, to explore vulnerabilities, to test reactions. Um, I... I think, you know, it, it, and this is, I think, an example of the challenge of cybersecurity that, that you know, the, you're always playing a defensive game and you can up, you can up your defense, but, you know, the, the attackers uh, are, get to be a, uh, a step ahead. So. Unfortunately, I think just the mere fact that they're even scanning and that the American public that doesn't understand computing hears that, that can in itself mm -hmm. can undermine mm -hmm. their trust and credibility in the election system. So um, it's, a, it's a broader, bigger problem than just a technical one. And I think, you know, I, I always used to say, just because it happens on a computer doesn't mean it's my problem. Um, I'm not sure I can say that anymore. <laughs> um, but, you know, helping, helping the public, helping people understand sort of the difference of what we think about cybersecurity, protecting infrastructure, defending infrastructure, versus an organization or an entity using what 
people might refer to as cyber, to have sort of other effects. Um, this, that is something that we distinguish um, you know, with, within the government. I'm not sure that everybody sort of fully appreciates that distinction. Mm-hmm. Um, but I will say, to Annie's point, um, if we have to sort of be conscious of um, ensuring that what we're doing um, and all the work that we're doing is about protecting our elections from any ability to um, sort of manipulate them. And, uh, and I think it's important that we also ensure that anything that we're saying or doing doesn't undermine that public confidence. And um, I think that's just something that we all need to be very conscious of. And our number one goal um, is to, ins- again, ensure that those who have those systems and run those systems have what they need to do their job um, and that we need to ensure that we're continuing to do it collaboratively and, and transparently uh, so that the public understands that there is, there's no reason to not have confidence in those systems. Uh, there's more work that we can be doing, and we are working on, on, on shoring those up, um, but there, there's no reason to not have that confidence. And, um, and I think that is um, a collective challenge. Um, we work very hard to continue uh-huh. to, um, to work, but that is, that is a collective government, private sector, civil society sort of challenge that we need to work through together as a country. Yeah. So just, just because it's on a, on a computer, it's not, not your problem. <laughs> uh, it reminds me that that, that whole uh, diamonds and toothbrushes thing came up in response to people at DHS thinking if it happened on a computer, if it happened on a, a, a phone, it was their problem. <laughs> uh, so I'm... Um, uh, why don't we turn to the audience for questions? So if you put a hand up and identify yourself, you were first in my line of vision. So you get the first question. Yeah, hello. Cal Secker here with Defense Daily for Jeanette. Um, the budget came out the other day, and there's a request to transfer from uh, DHS Science and Technology, uh, the R&D funding, maybe a lot of it, if not all of it, to uh, your division. Um, why is that? I think the senior administration officials talked about the need to uh, align the R&D funding with operational requirements. Mm-hmm. Requirements. So what wasn't being done that you think you can do better? And do you even have the authorities, though, to do R&D right now? And that, the fact that you're not a, uh, uh, you don't have the SIPA Act or whatever that is uh, mm. that, that's, been, that's been approved. Uh, thank you for mentioning the act that we're hoping to get approved. Um, that did go through the House. Um, what you're referring to is the legislation to change our name from the awful National Protection and Programs Directorate <laughs> to the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security yeah. Agency. And the, mm-hmm. the House did pass that, and we're working with the Senate on that. Um, so, yes, it, it's, it's that um, we have a close, we, do, we are authorized to do research and development. We do a very small piece of it. I would call it more, um, what we do is much more applied. Um, uh, research and development, and what we're working through is um, how do us and S and T work together with our kind of mutual authorities and our complementary authorities and in infrastructure to, um, to to do sort of what you said, what, uh, what other folks have talked about. Ensure that um, the the RDT and E that the research development and testing evaluation that's going on is um, directly aligned with operational requirements and the the notion being that you put it closer to the operators um, so that we can we can drive that but it's absolutely a partnership with our science and technology division what hasn't been done that you feel that needs to be done now oh. <coughs> There's a tremendous amount that could be being done. It's not necessarily because S and T wasn't doing it. Um, it's um, what we're what we're working through is what those um, research and development priorities are. Thinking about um, uh, sort of some of the capabilities. Uh, for, you know, for example, um, when we uh, talked about deploying capabilities to the civilian government, um, there's 101 agencies that we're deploying capabilities to. Many of them are small. Many of them are very large. Many of them are very large departments that have many small agencies, um, such as DHS and the Department of Commerce and and others. And so a lot of some of our challenges around, and again, I wouldn't, for those of you who are more pure sort of research and and development, I would call this more in the applied space, but how do you think about um, whether that's existing 
technology that's available or, or soon or R&D that's happening, our challenge is often scaling that across the entire civilian government. So looking at R&D around um, emerging technologies that um, could be useful to our mission, but we need to scale them. So, so investing in, in, in that, which can also often take a turn for some of those folks who are involved in that R&D. Also looking at supply chain. Um, what, where are those areas that we could be investing? And this is, you know, in the, in the world of R&D, this isn't an enormous amount of money, but it's enough that we could maybe start looking at some, um, some places in supply chain, applying some of those R&D dollars um, around some of these supply chain challenges. Um, you know, in, in challenges around encryption, um, you know, we sort of, encryption, very important from a cybersecurity perspective, um, but how can you sort of preserve the benefits of uh, encryption, um, and I'm speaking from a cybersecurity side of it, I won't um, try to uh, talk about what the, the sort of that law enforcement and other challenges, but sort of as we um, uh, see encryption, how do we ensure that uh, we preserve that benefit of encryption, but also have insight, and we don't lose visibility. And there's a lot of cool sort of research and development that's being done around that challenge. So that's sort of another area that it's very operationally relevant for us, but some of this R&D um, is um, sort of in some of the early stages. So that's kind of some of the examples of areas that we're looking at. And I think there's also a billion dollars uh, plussed up for for DHS yes. uh, for cybersecurity. Um, uh, it's not what a plus is up. It? It's not a plus up. We don't. Okay. No, we it's, there's we're already at roughly a billion. Dollars, okay. So I didn't want to. All right. <laughs> uh, that's right. It's uh, about two hundred million of uh, added funds of. Uh, um, as, at least as, as I read it. What's envisioned for spending that, that span apart from the, the R&D? Um, so um, a lot of, lot of our, our budget is focused on federal cybersecurity. And, and so it's, it's really looking at um, you know, sort of, um, advancing some of the continuous diagnostics and mitigation work. Um, it's looking at um, some interesting things that we've identified as we've deployed some of these tools and capabilities. What we've identified is that a lot of agencies um, don't have the, the governance in place that they need to actually um, benefit from those tools and capabilities, and they don't have some of the engineering capabilities. So we're actually building teams, um, uh, working with like digital services and others, to sort of build some teams that can help them develop their governance plan. Some of the, what I would call softer stuff, but actually just as important as the deployment of the tools. Um, we're also very focused on our internal analytics. So over the years, we've built a lot of capability to collect information, particularly from agency networks, but we also have um, you know, programs for um, private sector information sharing. And what we need to invest in, which we're you know, investing both in the um, previously, but really putting a lot more investment on the infrastructure to do better analytics that our analysts need, but also just the analysts themselves. Um, having these, these data scientists and these, these very sort of high-end um, folks that, that can come in and say, okay, we're We've got all this data. Um, what does it mean? So those are some of the key areas that we're, mm -hmm. that we're looking at. Good. A number of uh, more questions there. Um, yes, questions? sir, on the, the aisle. Wait for the mic. And... Thanks for your presentations. I'm Bobby Pestronk, a small business uh, proprietor now, but formerly a governmental public health official at the local, state, and federal level. In efforts to protect the public health, there are a range of incentives and uh, formal structures, also regulatory, for example, that exist at each level of government. And sometimes and often they're used at each level to improve the public's health and to seek better outcomes in public health. You've described uh, one instance this morning of elections being an area where particularly state governments and local governments are active in the cyber area. I wonder whether you could describe efforts, particularly at the local level, that you've seen where whole enterprise uh, initiatives involving uh, a community's industries or uh, uh, community sectors are working with their local governments to demonstrate examples of what you'd like to see at the federal level through your own work. Um, we do see some of that. Yes, definitely. We're seeing and we're, we're very encouraged by 
Sort of what we're looking at, of course, is much more of that national profile, but we've, been in, um, we've got folks out in the field. We're um, deploying more, more folks out in the field. Um, we are seeing that there's sort of, um, I guess, communities of interest just based off of location, right? And so different cities that are coming together that are um, taking some of the work around information sharing and analysis organizations. And how do we build a, a, either a regional hub for information sharing or a community, whether that's a city or you know, some other kind of segment where um, that, that organiz those different businesses and local governments are coming together. Mm -hmm. So we are definitely seeing some of that. It's... Um, um, all sort of different and very dependent on where they are. I know that I've, I've seen some work done out in um, the Seattle area. There's work that's done being done in Chicago, Boston, Texas. Is kind of, there's a lot of different sort of, um, those, there's, a, there's a lot of different pieces, and they're all very um, uh, grassroots, which I think is, is great. And what we've just been trying to do is encourage those and, um, and, and provide them with assistance if they kind of need any assistance, sort of figuring out how to, how to do that, how to stand that up. And if they'd like to connect with the federal government, you know, that's, that's great, but that, you know, they don't have to. It's, it's really focused on their sort of local. Can I pick up on a, a local point here? Um, an incredibly important local activity is 911. Mm. Um, the FCC sent to Congress its annual report on the state of 911 last week, I think. And buried in that report is the fact that only nine states and the District of Col I'm sorry, 11 states and the District of Columbia have any cyber mitigation strategy for 911 systems. And as those systems go digital, they become invitations to digital bad guys. Mm -hmm. And this is something, again, where there is a need for a regulatory step up that says this is what should be expected in terms of protecting the ability to get to someone when they call 911. And this is something that is not being pursued. The report was sent up and nothing has been said about this serious local public safety problem. I think one of the challenges is that when we try to do risk assessment, sometimes we forget that there are the whole sectors of risk that we're not thinking about. And so for, for this 911 example, I bet you there's a whole bunch of other ones that we've yet to uncover nationally. It's a great, it's a great point. And, 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 and what we have to do is start asking the questions, is there? Right. So, so right. the only reason that this was known is that during our period, we added to, as we tried to do with everything, we added to this survey of 911 answering points mm -hmm. questions about their cyber preparedness. Yeah. Right. If we hadn't answered the question, we wouldn't have known. Now the answer is the tree has fallen in the forest. We do know. What are we going to do about yeah. it? But you're right. There's so, but, but it's got to start with asking the question. Yeah, that's where we kind of keep coming back to. Um, and 911 is a great example. Um, mm -hmm. the, the communications half of my name actually is around the, the public safety communications mission that we have. Um, and um, kind of coming back to that, what are those critical services and functions that our country depends upon? 911 is one of those critical services and functions. And um, so while we've done a ton of work on um, sort of the, the more traditional thinking about um, interoperability and operability of public safety communication systems and, um, and systems like 911, um, we, we're just kind of starting to do that work around what about the security of those systems, and we've done work with FirstNet, um, doing you know work with some of the different providers, um, working with uh, Department of Transportation around the next generation 911 and the FCC. Sure. So I agree that this is this is sort of a great example of one of those areas where everybody's kind of been focused on a, a few areas that quickly come up, but until you kind of go through that whole thing, is what does our country actually really depend upon, and 
and then start going through what do we have in place to ensure the security and reliability and the resilience of those systems. Many of them already have a lot in place from more of a traditional emergency management, but they're not necessarily looking at the cyber side. So we're trying to kind of bring those two together, working with FEMA and a variety of other folks. So that's a really great point. Go to the uh, uh, back of the room over here. Uh, and gentleman in the white shirt there. Looks white from here, anyway. <laughs> Close enough. Lavender, maybe? Um, <laughs> Uh, Jill Marks from NextGov. Uh, so at yesterday's worldwide threats hearing in the Senate, there was a lot of talk about Huawei and ZTE. There's legislation right now that would bar them from government contracts. Um, you know, after, I think it was in October, the Kaspersky ban came out as a binding operational directive. Is DHS looking at more sort of government-wide bans of suspect uh, companies? This just goes back to, I would say, what in the, the supply chain conversation that we had is um, what the steps that we're taking right now is um, what's our understanding of the risk? What is industry's understanding of the risk? Are there ways to mitigate it technically um, that the, the government feels is, is sufficient? Um, and, and, and sort of then after we have those kind of conversations, it's also looking at, okay, well, what are the different tools? If the government is not um, in a position to be okay with that level of risk, then what are the different tools we have available to us? So that's, that's sort of where we are in that process. Are Huawei part of that conversation? I would say you know, we're looking across the board. Yes. Um, over here. Yes. <laughs> Ladies <Maybe>. first, definitely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Tasha Turpin. I'm um, from Richmond, Virginia, working for General Electric. I'm Senior Director for Technology and Risk. One of the questions that I had and, and what, what struck me was um, how we're protecting infrastructure. With the emerging regulations, such as China Cyber, that's already in effect, and then the upcoming GDPR regulations around data privacy, how are you, are you getting any in, input from your partners in um, the private sector on how they are preparing to comply with China cyber so that they continue to they can continue to compete globally and be successful in business and same with GDPR thank you yes <laughs> <laughs> I mean there's, there's yes we, we absolutely are talking to yeah them. So, so G, go ahead Tom. go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, well, as a G GDPR brings up, I, I think, a, as a pressing issue. I mean, one of the recommendations of uh, of the the commission was sort of to increase international engagement, uh, uh, and that's also reflected in in uh, the executive order. Uh, why um, and what's going on in terms of what can we expect in terms of cybersecurity engagement, particularly as you know, Europe, with implementing GDPR cybersecurity measures as it uh, implements uh, its, its uh, network information security directive. There's, it's a relatively green field. Mm -hmm. I Can believe we... the Cloud Act was introduced last week, right, mm -hmm. which is uh, looking yeah. at adopting the visa waiver as a way of handling uh, mutual legal assistance, assistance treaties. Yep. And uh, I believe it's supported by DOJ as well as uh, and it's a bipartisan mm -hmm. effort. And so I think, I think there's some efforts mm -hmm. that have been made there mm -hmm. as well. So, you know, the privacy question, the, the, the whole GDPR and, and privacy uh, in general, it's one of those things that you look at and you say, oh, this isn't a cyber issue, right? It's a privacy issue. No, excuse me. It's a cyber issue, okay? And, and, um, and, and, and there are impacts of not engaging in the privacy issue for instance. So, so we had a privacy protection rule for networks that as a component, I said before that we tried to make sure that cyber was in everything, as a component had a cyber part stipulating the responsibilities of those networks who collected information to provide security for that information and penalties if they did not. Well, unfortunately, the Congress threw out the entire rule. Um, but the point of the matter is that as a result of dealing with the 
privacy issue, you have also now opened a cyber hole because there is no requirement that this data that is being collected has to be protected. And one of the things that we had to do from an enforcement point of view was frequently levying fines against networks whose systems that were storing consumer data were being violated. Um, and we need to be proactive in that. But again, it's back to the point, can you be proactive unless there's somebody that says, excuse me, you're going to be proactive and we're going to ins expect that you're proactive and we're going to inspect that you are proactive. And that's a regulatory role. Yeah, I think... <laughs> Yeah. Well, right. And the other side of GDPR, of course, is that, well, maybe we ought to be making rules in the United States for the United States, mm -hmm. because in an interconnected world, somebody else makes the rules, and suddenly they apply here. You know, yeah. GD, when we talk about GDPR, we're also talking about our allies, but China has a new cybersecurity law where you can't, called. right, mm -hmm. so called. And so you can't have any data for any companies cannot leave the country, right? Yeah. And Russia is, um, is about, my understanding is that they want to move their portion of the internet completely off the internet. Yeah. So the, we have grand challenges yeah. globally. Yeah, we could talk about this for hours, I think. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I think Tom sort of said it's this, um, we've had the, that kind of privacy security debate um, for what I would call physical threats. Mm -hmm. We need to have that same conversation about online threats. And, um, and I think you, you're exactly right. Uh, we've had, um, I think the department has had one of the, uh, not the first, one of the first statutorily mandated um, privacy officers. And we've had a privacy officer for a very long time since the stand-up of the department. And we have privacy officials embedded in my organization that are looking at everything that we do that have a really, the, the, they're, they're privacy experts, but they now have deep cybersecurity expertise. And, and so they, we really have a lot of um, internal conversations about what are those, what are those trade-offs for the different systems we're developing and all that. And I think that's not a conversation that has been very widely um, happening, um, but it is because of GDPR, because of these various different things, we're now seeing more and more. And I, and I encourage that conversation because I think it, it's, it's, not, it's not one or the other, but I do think that we can't pretend that they're, they're two different things. Um, mm -hmm operating in two different paths. We have to, have, there's, there's balance that we want to achieve. And I completely agree that we need to um, really recognize that uh, we, you know, we don't want this fracturing um, of, of the internet. So how do we work with industry, many of which are multinational companies? Um, how do we work with our allies and others, whether that's through standards bodies, through the various different sort of international fora that exist, to, um, to, to look at those more coordinated approaches to preserve that global internet that we've all, frankly, benefited tremendously from. Okay. Now it's your turn. <laughs> Thank you. Enake International Urban Alliance. Uh, are we learning from the Russians? I lived under communism for 40 years. 40% 40 of the border was the Soviet Union. Those guys are perverse, to put it mildly. Are we learning from the Russians? Not sure I exactly understand. Uh, what way are we, learning from we, I must say, Americans are straight shooters. Yeah. But when you fight somebody who's not, you probably have to learn <laughs> some additional rules first, including cybersecurity. So we're certainly getting some training from them. <laughs> yeah, over here, sir. Thanks. Hi, Rick Weber, Inside Cybersecurity. Um, so going back to the NIST framework, fourth, fourth anniversary, uh, so we're not expecting big changes in this first revision to the framework. So is the NIST framework sufficient for dealing with connected toothbrushes and IoT risks and 
artificial intelligence and 5G and all the new things that are going to be coming online? You want to go first? Or you want me to I, jump mean, in? I think um, the, the NIST framework is not meant to solve every um, specific issue in cybersecurity. What it's meant to provide is an approach for managing cyber risk for an organization. And if, if your um, risk includes some of those pieces, then yes, that should be incorporated as a part of your cyber risk management. Um, you know, I, I would point to NIST has done um, work on each of those areas and, and published a great work on, you know, whether it's from Internet of Things or um, artificial intelligence. So there's a lot of great work that they've been doing, um, we're working on um, to sort of up the, the, the NIST framework. Uh, I wouldn't want to try to have the NIST framework be the solution for every single one of those problems when what the NIST framework is, is trying to do is get folks to um, think about cyber risk, whatever that looks like in their enterprise, and manage it appropriately. Mm -hmm. I think the beauty of the NIST framework is that you can tailor it, yeah. too. And so by making it so tailorable and so based on risk for every different organization or enterprise or domain, um, that enables you to kind of grow it and evolve it. Yeah, very much so. And, and you know, I can't resist piping in here. I mean, you know, four years ago, I talked about the, the opportunity for the NIST framework to help to develop standards to promote uh, awareness. And I think, uh, from my standpoint, I think it's succeeded in that far beyond what I expected uh, uh, at the time in terms of uh, the uptake, the adaptation in a variety of, uh, of places, in other countries, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in industry sectors. Um, so I think it's, it's succeeded in doing that. Um, and I think you know, one of the other beauties of it, although it was originally nominally named, uh, directed at critical infrastructure, um, it's applicable beyond that. Right. That's something that's more explicitly incorporated into the, the, the newer iterations. That this, this can be used, as Annie said, in a lot of frameworks. And I think it, it scales, uh, uh, scales very well, and it adapts very well. And that was, that was the intent not have it be one size fits all, not not have it be a checklist. Mm -hmm. I remember talking right. to Pat Gallagher, he said, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to you know, replicate FISMA, which has people sitting around doing a lot of reports, but not focusing on the outcomes. Mm -hmm. It's also elevated the discussion as an yeah. engineer, where now it's, there's an expectation that you have basic security in your systems. Yeah. And that's, mm -hmm. we've come a long way in that regard over the past Four years, I would say. And there's a basis to talk about it. There's yes. a structure, a language to yeah. talk about it, which Absolutely. is crucial. In the sweater here. And, and you know, we're running uh, short on time. We'll do you know, two or three more questions. But uh, I sort of want to wrap this up. Wait, wait, don't tell me style. Uh, so uh, you know, we'll, we'll wrap it up. We're ask, it's Valentine's Day uh, uh, 2019. Uh, what are we going to be talking about in cybersecurity? What are going to be the successes? What are the going to, what do you foresee as the challenges, sir? Uh, my name is Larry Feldman. I'm working for a consulting company G2, and NIST is our major um, client. So I am working on a cybersecurity framework on everyday basis. So I like we return back to cybersecurity. <laughs> And I have two questions. One question for Jeanette. Um, what are you expecting from this alive, I would say, document in the future? What do you want from DHS point of view to be included in future uh, cybersecurity framework publications, first of all? Um. You know, well, we've been working with NIST on the, you know, sort of the current update, uh, and I think, you know, some of the areas were around thinking about control systems and, you know, sort of thinking you've got enterprise networks, but then you've got control systems. How do they think about risk? Um, uh, there's, you know, there's a variety of areas. We've gotten a lot of, or, you know, NIST has gotten a lot of good comments um, that we're still working through. So I think it's sort of early to say, to tell on what the next update you know, what more we might want. I, I think I'm pretty um, pleased with how this is going. We have a very, very close partnership with NIST, and we work very closely with them on this. 
I hope we'll work with you in future, but I have a question for Annie. Let's Very last, quick question. Last question, please. Yes. Uh, for, uh, we have another. Uh, Very oh, quick okay. question. Did you have a question? <laughs> you get the last question, please. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to make one question per person because we're oh, running out of time. It was very important. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for everything you've shared with us. Um, I'm Marina Fazel, an Afghan American journalist. Um, I'm wondering if you can comment about uh, what, have, what, what are your findings pointing to in terms of the 2018 um, elections here? I read this morning in the paper about um, some of the uh, uh, election uh, workers are, don't have the budgets or clearances necessary um, to make the adjustments. Are you concerned about this upcoming election? I think the intelligence community officials you know, really laid out um, pretty clearly. Um, and then you have the worldwide threat assessment that's unclassified that can go into more detail. Um, uh, I can, there's the, the areas that I can handle and, and have authority to handle clearances. Um, again, ensuring that they have the, the ability to and, um, and access to the information, um, the services. We have a lot of services that have been developed um, for federal government entities that are available to them, um, that many of them are participating in that can, can help those who may have some challenges around resources. Um, so uh, I guess I would sort of sum it up with, with that. Okay. Well, we need to wrap it up. So February, Valentine's Day. Or well, you're going to start uh, at this end? 20 to 28, I'm going to start at that end, yeah. Okay. Uh, so as I recall, I was... wait, wait, don't tell me. It has to be short and pithy, yes. right? More. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and less. <laughs> <laughs> and somewhere in between. Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, you want to specify? More no, I what? just, I mean, no, I, I yeah. think that the, the, the reality is that, um, as I said at the outset, outset, cyber isn't something, it's everything. Yesterday we heard the testimony that we are under attack. It is going everywhere. And what will we be talking about a year from now? How it is in more everywheres. So more. I hope that we're talking about the fact that we'll have better attribution and that we will know exactly where our attacks are coming from and that we can have <coughs> consequences for that. Wow. Jeanette, you get the last word. Hmm, pithy. Um, I would hope that we've realized that co collective defense model that we talked about and that we are raising the cost for adversaries and, um, and that we have defenders that have what they need to defend their networks and protect those critical services and functions. Uh, well, I want to thank everybody. Wait a minute! For wait a minute. Being... Whoa, 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 whoa! You don't get off. <laughs> I'm the moderator. Come on, <laughs> come on. A year from now, when you're doing the fifth anniversary, Cam, what's it going to be? I'm um, so. I guess my hope is that uh, we see more adoption of NIST worldwide, um, uh, and that we make some significant progress of working with like-minded countries mm -hmm. on the like, collective. Uh, collective defense. Uh, we, you know, we've got shared networks, same threats, same technologies. Uh, we ought to be uh, working together hand in hand. Here, here. So I was getting to the thank yous. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. Thank you uh, to our panelists uh, uh, and especially to Jeanette Manfred for being here today and talking some, uh, as much as you did. Yeah.